Okay, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our closing keynote, John Traxler, Professor of Mobile Learning and Director of the Learning Lab at University of Wolverhampton. I'm particularly grateful to John because at the last minute I kind of sprung on him the need to try and sum up the day as well as giving him the, giving the talk he was originally Whoops. proposing to give. So um, thanks very much and over to John. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, apart from apparently attempting to summarise what's been happening, um, I did actually take quite seriously the, um, the remit to address um, the issue of I know, challenges and implications of mobiles, mobility, and higher education. And I, and I have been paying um, attention, uh, lots of attention to what's been going on um, in, in the interest of summing up. And um, what I'm hoping is that what I'll be saying may provide some kind of context or framework uh, for ab absorbing today's various contributions. Um, and it's in two halves. Actually, I used to have a slide of um, a cut and shut car to uh, kind of, you know, that bit where it says um, outline of the presentation. Well, mine seems to be kind of two unwieldy bits bolted together that may or may not be roadworthy. Um, and the first bit is, as it were, um, I suppose I'm um, from the mobile learning research community and we're kind of nearing the end of our first decade. Uh, and the first half is, as it were, looking outwards from that community that has been, I suppose, characterised by um, possibly a rather introspective dialogue between educationalists and technologists uh, within the context of, it, of the education system. And then the second half is um, from the outside, look, the inside looking out. Um, I hope that makes sense and I hope that becomes apparent. Uh, but there is a kind of disjunction um, in there. And I suppose recently, because I've been do, seem to be doing progressively more... Um, events to people who aren't uh, um, the, the chosen few involved in mobile learning, it seems sensible to um, provide some kind of critical overview. So that's the, um, the first half of the talk, if you like, to, to try and outline, may, maybe a bit critically, what, um, what we've achieved in the last seven or eight years. And I, I think, broadly speaking, there are two specific achievements. I, I wouldn't say we've proved anything. We might have demonstrated something. Um, and the first one that I'll unpack to some extent is the way in which what we've done is take learning in some shape or form to communities or people uh, or even countries and regions that have been previously unreached to um, other forms of, of uh, educational intervention. Um, and clearly in some cases, and this may be relevant to a limited extent in the UK, that's been to do with like, the sparsity of students or the the density of, lack of density of students, that the, the distance, the geographical um, spatial separation. So uh, uh, work I've done in um, East Africa, for example, that's been a very clear and obvious um, way that mobile learning has reached people that it wouldn't have reached um, previously. Um, but at home, there have been more kind of straightforward demonstrations. And this is from a, a GISC book of uh, 2005 that I think Andy alluded to indirectly. Um, and it was an attempt to not kind of get hung up on what's the technology. You know, is mobile learning defined by being a particular technology? Um, and this is actually uh, uh, the adult and community learning sector of what we do. And so I'm partly including it because they're just such a, often an overlooked um, part of the educational spectrum where the woman in question, the young woman is the tutor, she just puts these laptops in the back of her car. I mean, maybe now, you know, five years later, it's netbooks. But, it, it, you know, we shouldn't overlook perfectly kind of pragmatic and simple solutions to fairly pragmatic and straightforward problems where what we're doing is around, if you like, the learner experience rather than something defined in terms of this technology or that technology. Um, and I suppose when I've been pressed to say, well, okay, did I actually think this was mobile learning? I think there is a bit of a distinction. Um, and maybe there is a definition around technology to some extent, and it's around the fact that you wouldn't actually carry around a machine of this size um, for a bit of opportunistic learning or a bit of spontaneous learning or unpremeditated learning. Uh, you'd have to have a reason for carrying something like that around and maybe learning, uh, mobile learning, the way we've written it up has been characterized by words like kind of spontaneous, lightweight, opportunist, opportunistic, bite-sized, and you're never going to do that on those kinds of machines. But we're moving towards those kind of affordances becoming rapidly more available on all sorts of different machines. Um, this was an early experiment, uh, a project that we funded internally at Wolverhampton, supported by Sony, um, where we 
gave PDAs, as they were called in those days, uh, to what were classic, non-traditional students. Um, and again, it's attempting to reach out to, I don't know, our constituencies that weren't accessible with any other technologies. Um, students whose families or streets or regions or cultures were not traditional, they weren't familiar with higher education. Um, and again, this wasn't pedagogically profound. Uh, in fact, I'm not even sure if it was pedagogic. It was actually giving them the kind of support information for finding their way around university. I mean, often where you, know, where you have um, highly modular, very large, multi-site institutions, the complexity, the overhead for people who are not familiar with that kind of culture of being in those institutions is really quite intimidating. Um, but of course, as with many um, mobile learning projects, it wasn't sustainable. It only worked because Sony gave us uh, the kit. Um, there's a different example around this community as well of, of how we've used mobile learning to reach communities that we wouldn't otherwise have reached. And that's actually um, girl or women students from relatively, um, if you like, conservative communities, for example, in the West Midlands, where their, if you like, fathers or brothers drop them off at the timetable session, lecture, pick them up immediately after it's finished and take them home. Well, actually, with a private device, a mobile one as it happens, Again, we can actually give them um, social or informal learning that was otherwise maybe um, being denied them. Um, a different kind of community um, where lots of conventional schooling was really difficult. This is in one of the South African townships, um, part of a project called MobileLearn. Uh, sorry, MobileEd. Um, and again, it, because of the acceptability, familiarity with mobile devices, were enabled to reach these kids in ways that was kind of acceptable and unintimidating that was very, very difficult any other way. Um, this one, again, relates to a particular community that was very difficult to reach. And the history of it is, sorry, this is a circus. So I'm talking about circus folk, if you like, travelers, gypsies, and so on. Um, goes back to the work of the LSN, LSDA, as it was then, in the, one of the very early, if you like, flagship EU projects uh, called M Learning, that was specifically funded across three countries, I think five um, partners, to work with NEETS, if you're familiar with that, not in education, employment, or training. Um, and, th and it was predicated on a number of things which are still really quite relevant, I even now as we talk about ubiquitous or universal mobile devices across the whole population. And that's actually that people felt confident with small devices of their own um, that had, if you like, keyboards that they were used to. And it was seen as potentially, if you like, bait, or the thin end of the wedge, to get them into more formal learning uh, where, they had, where they had to use bigger keyboards, uh, to put it at its crudest. Um, and there was a perfectly straightforward economic agenda as well, that, okay, mobile learning was and probably still is quite expensive, but it would get them into the, if you like, the system, the, the, the massified education system where unit costs were lower. Uh, and in fact, the rest of the agenda was actually into jobs and paying taxes. Um, it was also, pre uh, and, and actually when we looked at the results, so I, I was the evaluator, when we, and, and it was quite large scale by comparison. It had 200 or so learners in all sorts of different groups. Um, it was, uh, the results were rather ambivalent. Half the students or the learners involved said, yes, it was great. They really loved uh, mobile learning. They'd like to go on to do more learning. Um, they'd like to progress. They'd like to get into college. Um, and the others said mobile learning was great, they really liked it, why should they want to do it in college? Um, uh, so that, you know, the kind of jury's out, I guess, on that. Um, there was also the notion floating around that was alluded to just before the tea break, that actually we were going to see some convergence. And we had lots and lots of projects where essentially they were using a particular device as a proxy. I think we used XDAs, if anyone can remember them. Um, and they were kind of proxies because sooner or later we would get to the kind of sunlit uplands of, of a converged generic device vaguely like the PC uh, and everything would become easier. I think the reflection um, in the course of today is no, that isn't happening, that may not happen. And so a lot of what we were hoping for hasn't materialized and things haven't got um, necessarily any easier. Um, if you like, on a more, well, still a kind of um, ambivalent kind of note, we have seen these devices extend learning to um, communities of users who are disadvantaged because of I know, physiological cognitive reasons. So this is a, uh, a chap who's visually impaired using a mobile device. 
and, and the, the way in which, for example, the um, hearing impaired community have taken to SMF, SMS, for example, is a, a very good case. Um, and another good case is dyslexic, people with dyslexia who have trouble organizing their time, mobile devices with their organizational capacity, with their personal information management capacity, have been very supportive. And if I'm making a kind of general case, this has allowed us to reach communities or people that otherwise wouldn't have reached. This is another one of them. Um, it's not just spatial distance or infrastructural distance, but all sorts of other distance. Uh, and finally, this is a <coughs> picture from um, uh, Nairobi bus station, um, taken out of a window, sorry, out with a, at least with a camera phone. Um, and that's a, a different argument in favor of mobile learning has been our capacity to exploit uh, dead time or kind of low grade time, bus queues in the lift, um, wherever. So I mean, I'm hoping this at least creates a plausible impression that what we've done um, has opened up educational opportunities. But I think I also need to say, I suppose, that it's a kind of deficit model. Um, it, it brings everyone up, hopefully, to the same level. Um, it's making up for shortcomings. Um, I think there is a, another half to what we've achieved. And this is a slide from a colleague uh, doing field trips in, uh, well, obviously, Sellafield, northwest, northwest of England. And I think our second claim, kind of speaking on behalf of the community, but let's hope they don't mind, um, is that, well, what uh, his name is Clive Roberts, what he's done is move from a situation where students take measurements on, um, I don't know, scrappy bits of paper that are environmental readings. They then go to the hostel, uh, write them up, put them into a spreadsheet on a laptop, um, and hope they're right, and hope it didn't rain on the piece of paper. And what we had, and this is quite some while ago, was to put them on a VB application on a mobile phone, which means they can capture the measurements um, in situ, that they can then do the processing in situ. Um, and you've, okay, it's a, it's a pr pragmatic solution, but it's actually a, a, a rather different one as well. Um, and it's one example of how I think we've extended the notion of learning to something in this particular case that can be what I'd call contingent, that actually these students can not only grab the data, uh, get it validated, um, and take it off site, but actually it can be processed um, on the spot in, in real time and can lead to them asking other questions, taking other, other measurements. And I think um, Steve Draper, for example, at Glasgow uses a similar term for the way in which the Zapper, you know, the RC audience devices can be used in teaching. It allows you not to kind of have a hardwired lesson, but one that can evolve on the basis of the environment or the responses or whatever. Um, and some work I did um, with the ICTD community, which is ICT, if you like, for development in, in developing countries, we used the Wiimote, which you've probably seen used as an interactive whiteboard. Again, it's a pragmatic solution because you save yourself 1,800 pounds rather than you know, buying, as it were, a real one from Smart or Prometheum. But it also allows a kind of contingent teaching. You can just do a presentation on the fly on any bit of wall. Um, you know, so I think mobile technology, if you, ha if you just have a you know, Pico projector, for example, uh, and maybe a laptop or even something smaller these days. So there's a, a type of teaching and learning that we haven't had before. And as I say, I'm, I'm calling it contingent. There might be better words. Um, but we've also used these technologies in our work to make um, learning, if you like, either more situated or more authentic for people like um, nurses, teachers, vets, midwives, whoever, who's, or, or, or students doing field trips. Uh, we've done it with uh, undergraduates doing religious studies, going to mosques and synagogues and churches, where actually you can take them out of the classroom and it becomes more meaningful. Work-based learning is another example, because they're actually learning in a meaningful and authentic environment. So these are students at uh, Imperial learning to be theatre operatives. Um, and you can see the obvious practical advantages to do with having lots of uh, reference material, being able to capture reflections, being in contact, if they're a dispersed group, with the rest of their cohort, with their tutors, um, to work on um, uh, assessments, um, to capture images as well. And so. Um, Yes, there's been quite a lot of this kind of work, most recently maybe with the Alps kettle in uh, the northwest of England, northeast of England, sorry. Um, and I think one of the things we looked back in 2005, which is still relatively true, is actually how do we find a business case for some of these things? You know, how does, it, how does mobile learning not look like just another way of spending money? Uh, well, I think in some areas, in some niches, like, as I say, nurses teaching, 
maybe where they're funded differently and maybe where there's a clear professional objective and a fairly kind of transparent argument that it's making teaching and learning better, maybe we have got a kind of sustainable way forward. Um, this is from Carl Smith and his colleagues at London Met and is a, an example of context-aware learning where uh, the learning is actually um, driven by the location of the learner, where they've been, what they're doing, um, their history. And so there's a, a, quite a long history of work in, say, museum spaces, art galleries, botanical gardens, castles, game parks uh, in South Africa, where what you're presented with, either uh, audio or video, um, enriches the learning experience and takes you out of the classroom to something that's more meaningful, but actually specifically tailored to where you are, where you've been. Um, and I guess we've got so far with that. Again, it's been project driven, um, but it's essentially been episodic in the sense that this experience has been so far based around on the v gallery visitor or the student in question gets issued with the device for the duration of the lesson. Um, and all the machine can learn about their preferences or their, if you like, learning style um, is gathered during that episode, then they hand it back. Um, so I think that's problematic, but maybe the increased affordability, functionality, uh, network coverage, and all have to open out the possibility that we can move into a more sustained version of context-aware learning, where the capacity of the machinery to learn about your preferences and to look at proximity, not just in kind of geographical terms, it may be social or pedagogic terms, um, becomes increasingly possible and interesting. And I suppose where also we can start to look at not just this, if you like, Web 1.0 version, where the machinery just tells you things, but actually where you're in a position to contribute and engage and people learn from what your reactions were as they come to the same space or come with the same history. Um, and finally, the idea of augmented reality, which is um, location-specific or context-aware, but also attempts to overlay. Um, this looks like Jane Eyre, I suppose, or something, of, something, um, something Brontean, maybe. Um, where what you're seeing... Um, in the real world is overlaid by um, extra experiences that enrich, in this case, enrich the, uh, the learning. Um, but having said that, I think there are considerable problems. Oh, this is um, courtesy of John Trinder, uh, I ought to say. Um, and it illustrates some of the problems we have and have had in the last um, eight years, nine years, ten years. One of them is scale. Um, there are very few, have been very few mobile learning projects of any size at all. Um, I mean, curiously, in the school sector, the biggest one in the country, if not the world, is in Wolverhampton. Um, uh, but most, most of our projects, most of our trials have been um, small scale. They've been a cohort. Um, and they've also been short term. We haven't cro cracked the, the problem of sustainability, as I said earlier. Um, and as we look at what this is offering to the university sector, then clearly these are significant challenges. Um, most of our work has been around projects, as I say, and, and one of the things you'd hope we would have generated, as it were, in order to tell you, was evidence. Um, and I don't think we've actually got sufficiently competent kind of methodologies to, tell you, to give you credible or rigor rigorous evidence about how good is learning with mobile devices. Partly because um, it's, it's, um, of a kind of philosophical problem, a lot of our research methods are to do with being stationary. Um, and, I mean, for example, when I was the evaluator for the M Learning Project, which was about kind of literacy and mobility, the original proposals for evaluating it were to make the students sit down and write things. Um, you know, so that if you see, there's a kind of paradox or a contradiction there. We haven't evolved methods that will give us evidence that is aligned to what we're doing and credible and um, trustworthy. Um, and we've tried uh, to kind of improve the kind of signal-to-noise ratio in our projects, but as soon as you do that, it involves, well, there's the issue about kind of throwing out the baby and the bathwater. You know, learning with mobile devices is, a bit, is about moving around. It's kind of woven into everything else you're doing, and it means gathering data um, is really complex because everyone's doing several things at once when they're moving around, when they're using mobile devices. And that, in part, accounts for the problem we have with evidence, which I can guess, in part, it explains our problem with sustainability, that we can't actually be convincing enough. Um, and I think there's also a problem with equity, if you like, that there is a considerable risk, and, and maybe that kind of echoes what people have been saying here, that what we're doing 
works for rich people or rich institutions or rich countries, and there is a ongoing issue about other people, other institutions being left behind. Um, this uh, was taken by uh, Agnes Kukorski Hume a, few, a while ago, and she was actually illustrating the fact that for her mobile device, whichever it was, you actually get an awful lot of other stuff, clutter basically. But the reason I'm showing it is actually um, just to make the point that I don't think mobility or moving around or mobile learning is, as it were, free. Uh, all of a sudden we get a different set of affordances about, the, uh, uh, well, people sometimes call them tetherings or moorings, actually. You no longer think about where you're going to sit in terms of is it comfortable or the sight line or the audio. You start thinking about where are the electrical sockets, um, where is the coverage, is there adequate coverage, I don't know, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, this, that and the other. And, and so all of a sudden we start redefining how we understand the architecture of, the, for example, the spaces we want to, to teach in. And, and, it, and that may be true of the geometry of the spaces, but it may also be true of our understanding of the time that teaching and learning takes place. So it's to do with how long have you got till the battery goes flat, um, or what's the envelope of your text messages, you know, have you used up the bundle and that kind of thing. And it's parallel, in a sense, to the way that the car is portrayed as the great kind of mobiliser of the 20th century. Yes, it is, but if you drive around London, you spend a lot of your time worrying about where's the parking spaces, uh, where are the petrol stations, and is it all turning into Los Angeles? Um, so, as I say, none of these things are free. They all come at some kind of uh, a cost. Um, I think if we're to move forward on getting a better understanding of mobile learning and the possibility of learning with mobile devices, we need to look at the projects and worry about why so few of them have sustained. And this is a, a kind of reference to um, the, the some fell on stony ground um, issue. The way our projects have been funded, maybe lots of it, educational innovation has been funded, has been on the basis of looking at the project and wanting it to be good and hoping that the kind of host environment, the soil, will like it. And I think there's been a lot of emphasis on the seed and the project and insufficient emphasis on the host organisation, its expectations, culture, standards, uh, quality regime, and all the rest of it. And that's maybe partly a remark about the culture of innovators and researchers versus the culture of, if you like, rank and file teachers or quality assurance people. Um, and I kind of worry that so far what we've achieved in lots of different projects um, has been to prove that if we run mobile learning projects or projects about learning with mobile devices and we fund the gadgets, then maybe all we're doing is proving that spending money on education improves education. Um, and we need to look at the possibilities of there being no money and um, what can we get out of mobile technologies if we're no longer funding the hardware, the gadgets, and all the rest of it. And I think, again, that's a, it's, over, it's overlooked or it's uh, underplayed. Um, this is Iron Bridge near where I live, um, and it's the world's first iron bridge. Uh, and because of that, the uh, designers, I guess, were fairly conservative, so it's actually designed along the lines of uh, a wooden bridge. Um, and it makes me think of, um, maybe, I'm not sure if it's an urban myth, but the expression that when a new technology comes along, the, the first things you do are the, the ones that were previously difficult, and then you try and do what was previously impossible, uh, and finally, you, you try and do what was previously inconceivable. And that's a kind of considerable challenge, actually, you know, our, um, because I think the history of um, a lot of work with using mobile learning and mobile learning technologies comes out of e-learning. It's to do with the frustrations of it. Um, um, and it's a lot of what we're doing. For example, putting Moodle on a, um, uh, on a phone, for example, is treating mobile learning as a kind of impoverished but portable version of e-learning. Um, and it's, if you look underneath that, you find out that um, the disciplines that have been supporting e-learning, I think have been maybe psychology, technology, and education, and a lot of their understanding and their theorizing of what happens in e-learning and consequently of mobile learning have, have been hardwired into it because that's what they start, where they started from. They haven't started from anthropology or sociology or lots of other different things. Um, and so we're still struggling with a, an understanding of learning with mobile devices that doesn't kind of take us back to uh, e-learning. And if we look at how it's worked out in other parts of the world, um, there's, there are wholly different models, for example, in Southern Africa, where it's seen as, where supporting learning with mobile devices is seen ar around the issue of uh, service delivery. 
it's kind of making the machinery of education run better. It's telling people to pick up their assessments uh, or pay their fees or go and get a parcel from the post office. Um, whereas in the US, again, there's a kind of different educational tradition. Um, and they see it, in the words of an American colleague of mine, in terms of um, drill and kill, a very kind of behaviorist, um, making people do exercises. Um, and that's uh, maybe games-based. Uh, whereas ours seems to be heavily or maybe worryingly kind of theorized. And um, I'm not sure if that holds us back sometimes. Um, in conversations way back with uh, Helen Beetham from JISC, um, we used to talk about whether there were two basic paradigms around um, e-learning uh, or learning with technology. Um, and the conventional one was the one I think she called uh, the world in a box, where what you try and do is create experiences within the classroom, within the computer, um, you know, where you try and abstract and draw everything in in order to kind of manage and explain it. Um, and so if you look at simulations, for example, they're an attempt to put the world in a box to make learning manageable because it, um, well, it, man it breaks it down, it, it runs on a predictable basis. Um, but what we're being offered with mobile devices is, is um, what Helen would call the box in the world, where uh, we can take the gadget out. Um, and all of a sudden, learning becomes potentially uncontrolled, messy, you know, kind of contingent because the environment is a significant part of the learning experience, whereas bring, attempting to abstract and bring everything into the classroom kind of sanitizes it. Um, so that's um, an issue in how we try and understand what the potentialities of mobile learning for our um, universities are. And I guess another issue of saying that what we've done with mobile technology has been an outgrowth or a um, continuation of, of e-learning has been Sometimes what we've achieved with e-learning, people have characterized as a kind of industrialization uh, of learning. You know, we've turned the universities into um, battery farms or uh, factories. Um, I mean, if that's the case, or if that's a plausible depiction, then we have to worry about how do mobile uh, devices fit into that. You know, are they a kind of the flexible, lear the flexible manufacturing version of that? Is that the way Nissan and um, Saab manufacture cars? You know, does, is, it, is it somehow... Uh, analogous to the ne next generation of manufacturing. Okay, so that's a kind of critique of uh, where I think we've got to with using mobile technologies for learning in the way that's been characterized by the, the mobile learning research community. But clearly the important thing really is actually um, the extent to which mobile technologies are universal, ubiquitous, pervasive, and all the rest of it across society. Um, where I worry that we're getting left behind and we're not understanding what's going on in the wider world. I don't have any statistics about, because I can't remember things, um, about um, how pervasive mobile technologies are, but I have been told, because um, I remember these, uh, in Uganda apparently there are more mobile phones than there are light bulbs. Um, and um, in India there are apparently more mobile phones than there are toilets. Now I don't know what's that, what that's telling you about the relationship between toilets and light bulbs, who knows. Um, but I think in terms of what, in the, what, the way that might challenge the university sector, we have to look at how that's challenging all sorts of different um, parts of our environment. We're obviously seeing a vastly increased impact on the economy, and clearly part of our job is to train people for that economy. Um, so these are, I don't know if you're familiar with Tezos, these are retail holsters for Tezos. Um, uh, but the, the, the attraction is they're all MP3 enabled. So, um, <laughs> and they, the manufacturers say they put the cute into electric cute. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's, well, I can say it's a thin end of the wedge, let's hope not. Um, but the world of work that our students are going into is being rapidly transformed by um, new products, new services, companies that, that didn't exist five or ten years ago. I worked with a company in um, Nairobi who say they are East Africa's Lords of the Ringtones. You know, they've got a business that you couldn't have conceptualized ten years ago. There are new forms of asset, well, like ringtones or downloads. Um, uh, and again, and new jobs that didn't exist before. And that's part of what we're supposed to be training our undergraduates for. Um, but also, people argue that um, mobile devices are changing not just the types of jobs, but how people do those jobs. You know, remote jobs um, used to give workers a measure of independence or 
autonomy, but actually mobile devices maybe restrict that. They allow increased oversight um, or de-skilling, you know, because you don't, know, you don't need to know how to mend a photocopier. Now you just read the instructions on your mobile phone, which not only tells you what to do to repair the mobile phone, but also tells your employers where you are. And there's um, the literature talks about the day extender syndrome, the constant pressure on our private space, courtesy of mobile phones, to increase the working day. So all of those are part of the work environment that the universities are supposed to be recognizing and training for. And I guess there's also a relationship between education and learning being seen as work. You know, they, you know if you try to persuade kids to go to school, uh, then there might not be much intrinsic motivation. There is an element that they have to, they're coerced. It has similarities with work in that respect. So it, it kind of bleeds in either direction, the, the, the connection between uh, work and learning. Um, Someone, I think, sorry, Richard Noss used the phrase epistemological revolution. And I thought, ah, that's, what the, word, that's the phrase I've been looking for. Um, because he was talking about the fact that these technologies, and if, he was only talking about computers, let alone mobile phones. Um, these technologies change uh, what we know and how we know it. And by inference, they change what we learn and how we learn it. Um, but we see communities of people, because these technologies can produce images and ideas and information and knowledge, produce, generate, disseminate, have communities that are disjoint from what we teach in universities um, that value their own kind of knowledge that uh, can discuss and consume a specific set of images, ideas, and value those. Um, and although it might be overstating it, you can see how that challenges the notion there's a kind of universal canon of things we all need to know to be you know, good citizens. You know, we need to uh, be able to read Jane Austen um, and we need to train for our jobs. Well, actually, there's a third possibility that we can exist just knowing stuff that interests us and the people around us and that we value and they value. Um, I mean, there has been an argument also that becoming involved in the world of Warcraft improves your metacognition, which sounds, I think finds slightly weasel words. But, um, so I think what this may be portraying is kind of fragmentation, to use that word again, um, of knowledge, you know, separate communities, maybe transient, uh, maybe ephemeral, maybe highly local, but no longer with a kind of overarching notion of there is stuff we all need to know and universities are the repositories for it. Um, this was taken outside the uh, BM, BMA, sorry, in Tavascott Square, 7th of July in 2005, was it, the bombings? Um, and it's an example of citizen journalism where um, bystanders have captured this stuff with their camera phones, they put it onto um, Flickr, everyone around the world has seen it. Um, and again, you see the kind of generation of information and knowledge that has short-circuited the institutions, I don't know, Fleet Street or the BBC or the Ministry of Information or whoever. And that's seen as a kind of democratizing um, feature. No doubt, uh, you know, and it's making knowledge and information more widely accessible. Uh, that's true, but you have to bear in mind, of course, these, could have, these pictures could have been taken by the bombers themselves, and there would be an entirely different spin on the, the knowledge that that was um, being seen to support. So again, I'm kind of portraying the possibility that these technologies um, produce a more fragmented, partial, subjective uh, view of what we know. Um, There's also the notion that these technologies, as I've said with the day extender syndrome, you know, where our employment presses on our private time and our private space, these technologies also allow our private space to push back. Um, there's a paper for some years back called No Dead Air. You know, we talk about my music and the fact that I can have my music with me. It means that actually we're in a different, as it were, realm. We're not necessarily in the physical realm that we're in. To, any, to the extent we used to be, because we've got this space around us, our private space, um, people listening to their iPods at work. So um, it's part of an argument that um, the boundaries between different kinds of space, public and private spaces, are pressing backwards and forwards on each other, uh, and it's being catalyzed by these um, technologies. Um, there's also an argument in the, in the literature of mobility is where people talk about um, what it's doing to our sense of time. And people use the phrases like slipperiness of time, um, the softening of schedules, the micro-coordination of everyday life. 
meaning that all of a sudden we're no longer um, tied to a kind of Newtonian time where we have to do everything on a universally agreed time, but we can actually renegotiate meetings uh, or appointments with, uh, with our phones. We can SMS when we're late, when we're early, when we've missed something, when we've forgotten something, and you can see it no longer becomes as absolute as it used to be. Uh, one author talks about the wristwatch as being kind of handcuffs. It ties you into a I don't know, sort of Newtonian industrial time, whereas the mobile phone does the very opposite. It releases you from that. All, all of a sudden, you're in a position to renegotiate all of your appointments on the fly. Uh, of course, unless you're at university uh, or an institution, uh, you know, which are much, much more fixed. You know, they're governed by um, what uh, schedules, calendars, timetables, deadlines, and stuff like that. So again, there's a tension on the university sector, maybe university institutions. Um, I think there's a different pressure as well, actually, that we used to have a kind of, um, we used to be synchronized. Like when I went to school, um, we could all talk about what we'd seen on television the previous night, which is Monty Python. And it kind of gave a, it synchronized us. And I don't think we can anymore. You know, the, 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 the volume of um, channels, video on demand, actually all means that, the, you know, we arrive at the water cooler the following morning and there's probably nothing we can talk about, uh, you know, that we have in common. Um, there's also something in literature where people describe how the various mobile devices are, uh, are watering down the here and now. And someone talks about pre-visiting places. Mobile technologies and personal technologies allow you to actually be somewhere before you got there. And actually, if you've recorded them, they allow you to be there after you've left there as well. Um, and how that kind of dilutes the here and now. So um, uh, I find it with sat-nav, which is a bit scary. Um, you're inclined to, I'm inclined to look at the sat-nav on the dashboard rather than look at the road because it does more or less kind of predict where I'm going to go. Um, and Google Street View, you know, and the way people research where they're going on holiday. Um, uh, you know, the, like I say, they've been there before they got there. Um, uh, so th there's a general kind of remark about the extent to which this is changing the, the places, spaces that we live in. Um, this was taken by Jonathan Donner, who works for Microsoft Research, and actually not sure if it's apparent, it was taken outside Microsoft in Bangalore. Um, and actually, um, I don't know, he's written a paper about missed calls. Um, uh, and missed calls are those ones that are deliberately not intended to be answered. Uh, so in the UK, like when your taxi driver is outside, he'll give you a missed call. And they get really shirty if you actually answer it, because it costs some money. Um, and actually, there's a whole lot of different ways in which missed calls are used around the world. And this is how it's used in India, if you want to tell a firm to try and sell you some services, you give them a missed call. But it's an example of appropriation. I think that's a problem we have in the educational sector um, of understanding the changed nature of that appropriation. We've had a model of appropriating corporate technologies, you know, PCs, from international business machines, if you see what I mean. Um, uh, and we've got a model of how we adopt them or adapt them for education and how we roll them out, and how we organize change from the top within our institutions. And all of a sudden, we have a scenario where the devices we're trying to co-opt or appropriate for education are, are now actually individual ones. Uh, they're kind of designed and marketed and owned on a, a kind of leisure, lifestyle, retail basis. And I think that is problematic for how we roll out change, educational change within our institutions. We can't just kind of drop it in at the top and then regulate how it percolates down through our institutions because it's actually beating on the walls trying to get in. Um, and I think there's a different problem, maybe a, a, a philosophical one, about how, because technology is so ubiquitous, the phrases technology-enhanced learning or maybe technology-supported learning are no longer appropriate. Um, the technology is the learning. The technology is us. It's no longer appropriate to see technology as some kind of dumb, uh, if you like, conduit that you push learning through or some kind of dumb receptacle that you put the learning in. But actually, um, it is the learning. And so I think the relationship, which is maybe quite meaningful to the, a lot of people here coming from the, and I ought to stop using tech support services now, but coming from that sector is actually they're not the support, they're integral. Um, it, you know, the learning is one and the same with the technology. Um, we also need to recognize at a different, rather human level, the way in which these technologies are altering social behavior. So I'll just mention three things. And one is how, they, how we have to learn, maybe as lecturers, maybe standing in front of people, 
Um, the extent to which uh, mobile phones particularly change expectations about how people behave with each other. You know, so the mobile intrudes and the virtual intrudes in the way that a desktop computer never would. If you engage with a desktop computer, you're in a kind of bubble with your back to the world. If you engage with a mobile phone, it's kind of woven into the rest of the world. And that means actually, of course, people get phone calls in the middle of face-to-face -face conversations. And we have to learn a whole new repertoire of, uh, they're called tie signs, but to kind of signal that I still value this conversation, but I'm answering this call. I'm doing the body language almost automatically. And also to cope with what people have called enforced eavesdropping. You know, you can be in a train and someone's having a kind of domestic on their phone next to you. Um, and again, you've, we have to learn a whole lot of social cues to say, no, I'm not at all interested. I'm kind of turning away and I'm hiding in my newspaper. Um, and you see um, stuff in maybe the Times Higher where, where you realize how kind of fragmented and generational that might be, you know, because you get kind of grumpy young men, grumpy young men complaining about students texting in lectures. Well, um, yeah, they do, they will. Um, it's, you know, we need to recognize actually that is the world we're in and it's affecting all sorts of other things. Um, and I think we're also seeing amongst communities, oh, sorry, I think we're seeing communities growing up in these various technologies, each of which, uh, to kind of, in a sense, move on from what I was saying, each of which has their own taste, expectation, values, protocol, etiquette, uh, again, fragmented, ephemeral, but to recognize as institutions, we are relatively fixed and lagging behind, and the audiences or the people we have responsibilities to reach out to don't necessarily work the same way as us. There's also a literature of, of the moral panics around um, mobile phones as well, which is worth bearing in mind when you kind of start to get aerated about this stuff and worry about, well, all those slides of students on mobile learning projects who seem to have appalling posture. Um, or, or the fact that um, using mobile devices is frying their brains or making them all stay in bed too long um, or implicated in the decline of literacy um, or facilitating paedophilia and all the rest of it. There's a big literature saying, watch out, um, you know, uh, it seems to be how the media latch on to various themes at various times and the, the moral panics of mobiles is just uh, one of them. And maybe teachers' concerns about losing control as the technology shifts from being the institutional stuff on desks to the stuff in students' pockets is one of those moral panics. I don't know. Um, and finally, <laughs> is that just about right? Um, and finally, there's also the issue about what this stuff does to our sense of identity. Um, some years ago, I heard a man from Nokia talk about the fact that within the company, um, mobile phones are referred to as our new private parts. Um, they've become us. Um, and other, other phrases in the literature are um, that uh, they become embodied. They become an, another limb. Um, they're almost like, is it Philip Pullman's account of uh, demons? You know, that you can't be, if you're, if, you're, if you're separated from it with the guillotine, you kind of go into some kind of psychic meltdown. Um, or that they're prosthetic, you know, they're another, another limb. Um, and in one of the literatures uh, about um, this aspect of identity and what mobiles is doing to it, um, there's a, an account of what I remember being called Camilla Gate, where the heir to the throne uh, also refers to his mobile phone as a body part, but anyway, um, <laughs> we won't go into which one. And there's the aspect in which, the aspect of which um, it's coupled with identity to some extent, but how these devices, are kind of, if not, are implicated in an increased sense of uh, surveillance, you know, we are being looked at more, our images are being captured 300 times a day and all the rest of it. And what that might do to the sense of, I don't know, presumably trust that is needed between learners um, and their teachers and their institutions.